another topic that wasn't addressed much in uh, your lecture yesterday, uh, but I know something that you've mentioned and even mm -hmm. uh, mentioned it briefly in the last question. Let's try and talk about briefly sort of a biblical theological trajectory, um, how the doctrine of hell is related to the Old New Testament. Um, I know quite frequently in the popular uh, mindset we talk about the law or the God mm -hmm. of judgment in the Old Testament, the God of mercy in the mm -hmm. New Testament, uh, per perhaps a sort of Marcionistic way of, of uh, undermining the doctrine of hell in the New Testament, the Christian God. So how do we think from a, a canonical trajectory? Good, um, good question. Well, let me, let me say first of all that I believe that it, if we look in the Old Testament as well as in the New, that mercy has priority over judgment. One of the things that is really striking to me as I read the Old Testament is the astounding mercy of God. And this includes even nations that we might not think of as, as, as worthy of God's mercy, mercy, those that were enemies of, of God's people, Israel, Egypt, of course, oppressed Israel, the Ammonites, the Moabites. Um, there's a passage in the book of Isaiah early on, it says, woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, that God acknowledged that he had, he had raised up the Assyrian army to come against the northern kingdom to bring judgment. But, and then that Assyria comes under judgment, and you think, well, that's the end of the story. Well, not so, because you leave, read later in the book of Isaiah, and there's an astounding passage where God speaks of how Egypt and Assyria and Israel will all be worshiping him, the true God, together. And he talks about, you know, Israel, his inheritance, and Egypt, the work of his hands, and, you know, uh, Assyria, my people. It's just an amazing passage that these nations that have been alienated from God are brought back. So there are other cases we could point to, the case of the wicked king Manasseh, who's one of the most wicked of all the rulers of Israel, and he practiced a witchcraft and divination and even child sacrifice and yet when he goes into judgment he's greatly humbled before uh, before his enemies he calls out for God's mercy and then he's not only restored to to Jerusalem but he actually goes back to his throne and then the passage in Chronicles says and then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God and so it illustrates the passage in Romans that that says that the, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So that, that's the one theme of mercy. But then there are some judgments of God that are simply irrevocable. The most characteristic one would be that on Babylon, the end of the book of Jeremiah. It also appears in the book of Isaiah. And what I see in scripture is that the common denominator of these permanent judgments of God is arrogance and prideful rebellion against God. The, the daughter of Babylon says, I sit as queen and will you know, we'll remain forever. I will never know mourning. I will never know judgment. And there's something about that arrogant, uh, intractable choice of rebelling against God and then this prideful assumption that one will never come under judgment. That's what seems to bring down God's indignation yeah. and judgment. And then that language of Babylon gets picked up, of course, in the book of Revelation. And so the final end times judgment in Revelation 17 and 18 is described as, under, is, is coming upon Babylon. And... Uh, it's, Jeremiah says very clearly that, that the, the city will be a ruin, it will never be rebuilt. So we have to look, if we're true to all of Scripture, and see the incredible mercy of God, that judgment is not final in many, many cases, but then that there are some judgments that are final. And I, I mean, and to piggyback off of that, when you, depending on how you approach the Old Testament, but to see the Old Testament as um, containing types and shadows and prefigurings of what's to come, um, which is, I think, an appropriate way to read the Old Testament, to look at the judgments that you see, such as the flood, um, the destruction of the Canaanites in um, Canaan, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, you have these kind of high water marks of judgment that really stand out. And, to, and, and to, to draw a sharp line that says, well, that's the Old Testament, New Testament. Well, that's not how Jesus interprets the Old Testament. He sees in the Old Testament foreshadowings of what's to come, right? So those, those judgments... Um, show God's response when, when humanity, as it were, goes completely rabid, right? Like when it's finally like just com completely unhinged, that's going to be God's response. And so they're prefiguring, I, I read those as prefiguring of the ultimate eschatological judgment that then you're mm -hmm. referring to with Babylon right. that you see in Revelation. Um, and in those, in those Old Testament judgments, you do see kind of that entrenched, intractable mm -hmm. rebellion. Like when things get kind of that that um, that bad, mm -hmm. then God comes in with really severe judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the trajectory then, I think, of 
of like what sin is doing in humanity. It's like pushing us in the direction of like entrenched rebellion against God. So that like in Revelation, what you see as, as, as God's judgment is coming down upon the world, the response of the of, uh, of, of humanity is not to plead for mercy, but is to gnash their teeth, which is a sign of anger, right. right? To gnash their teeth and curse God, right? So like sin has become so um, corrupting, as it were, uh, in, in like the human condition that like we actually, um, we don't, we're not pleading for mercy when God's judgment comes. We're, we're angry at him, we're gnashing our teeth at him, we're cursing him, like that's the effect of sin. Um, um, that what, what it does to humanity that brings about the wrath and judgment of God. Mm-hmm. You guys are talking, at the, one of the biblical theological themes that I'm really thinking of is that of the day, the day of the Lord and how central the notion of judgment is, whether it's a cleansing, renewing judgment or a, a damning um, fire and brimstone judgment. Judgment does run through the whole of scripture, yeah. often referred to as, as the day of the Lord. Sometimes people thought it would be cleansing and it, uh, it was not as, mm-hmm. as uh, was it Joel warned uh, Israelites, among others? But yeah, and I mean the, the issue of judgment. It's interesting because that we always think of that kind of as the dark side, you know, of mm-hmm. God, or we, we can we can frame it up like that. But um, and there, that is there is a reality to that. But judgment, you judge something as wanting because it threatens something that you value, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, so judgment in many ways, I think, is an expression of God's love. Now, I don't mean it's an expression of God's love to the one that he's judging. I mean, but it's an expression of God's mm-hmm. love to those that he values and loves, mm-hmm. right? So um, when the saints under the altar say, how long, O Lord, how long, mm-hmm. you know, we've been beheaded, we've been wronged. We're longing for your judgment mm-hmm. to come, which would be an expression of your commitment to us, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, I, I sometimes you read some of the um, the defenses of hell, and, and we can almost talk about it like, you know, oh, I just feel really bad that we have to defend hell. It's such an awful thing, and the judgment of God. I really wish it wasn't there, but like we're, we're apologizing for it all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's a, an appropriate um, there's an appropriate longing for the judgment of God that we, that should be present in in the heart of a believer. That we would not see it as something we need to apologize for or always feel mm-hmm. bad about, but. But God's judgment shows his commitment both to his son, his mm-hmm. son's glory. I mean, when you see Jesus coming in Revelation 19 mm-hmm. and he's blood all over his clothing, right? Like he's coming because his bride has been mm-hmm. wronged, you know? And so mm-hmm. it's, he's not just coming in kind of just a, a wrath because there was some, you know, we didn't pay our parking tickets. There's some standard that we've fallen short of and he's just got to come and like spank humanity. Mm-hmm. But like humanity has turned rabid, is persecuting his bride mm-hmm. and he's coming to deliver his bride from the, you know, the dragon, the beast, the antichrist. And he's full of wrath because he loves his bride. And I think we, if you take away wrath, you also take away love too, mm-hmm. you know, to try to like downplay wrath. In the end, you lose the love that you're trying to magnify. Mm. You talked uh, in, in our previous conversation about two different forms of judgment. I don't remember exactly how you articulated it. One was merciful and the other was sort of... Well, you see, yeah, restorative. Restorative. Restorative judgment versus a, was a, a permanent or irrevocable, irrevocable judgment. And so those, those are the two things I see in, in the Old Testament. And, to, and to, to, to build on what uh, Gerald has just said, you know, I think Psalm 2 is very interesting, one of the more apocalyptic sections of the Old Testament because it, the, the nations are raging yeah. against the Lord and against his anointed, or we could translate that as Christ. And, um, and then God responds, as for me, I've already installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So guess what? He's already reigning. And, um, and then God speaks to the son, says, ask of me and I will give the nations if you're, as your inheritance. And so Jesus Christ in his, his sinless life and his work upon the cross is dying, is rising again. He, he has already won for himself the nations of, of the world to come under his righteous and holy reign. And the, that psalm ends with this advice to the yeah, kings of the earth. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun, yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, lest you perish in the way. So it's, it's a warning to those that, again, notice the element of arrogance. That these are, these are kings who say, we're going to ca- tear away the, his cords from us. We're going to rebel against. We're going to knock God off the throne. And it actually says in that psalm that he who sits in the heavens scoffs. He laughs mm-hmm. at them which is a strong way of saying that the very, it's a preposterous idea mm-hmm. that even the, the, the most powerful people of earth could, could overthrow God's reign. Um, let, me, let me touch on something a little bit different, and that is that 
how the church culture, I think, has absorbed some ideas from enlightenment and from secular thought. That I think that there's some in the church that have the notion that, you know, the, our problem in the church is that we're, we just need to be more loving. You know, if we are more loving, more caring, if we're nicer, then the world surely is going to beat a path to the door of the church. Our numbers will increase, people will respond. Well, think about the message of the gospel. So the, Jesus is, by common uh, assent among all Christians, the, most, the highest expression of love that's ever existed. And what happens then when perfect love comes into the world? People plot together and, and murder him mm -hmm. to take him out of the way. We forget that how the story ends with Jesus. It's, it's, so if we look just from this sort of abstract theological standpoint, kind of from heaven downward, and say, oh, well, this is redemption accomplished and so on. But you look from the bot bottom up view on the cross, Jesus is plotted against, he's taken out of the way. And Jesus says in, in John 15, if they hated me, they will hate you also. And so that's really a sign that we have some of the wrong assumptions at the very outset. We have a naive, we've adopted this idea that everyone is basically good. And if they just are given a clear and loving presentation of the message about Jesus, that they will respond positively. I don't think the scripture allows us to come to that conclusion. Yeah, and I think that that ties into just a, a misunderstanding about the, um, the, the destructive aspect of sin. Like what sin does to the human heart in terms of turning it away from God, mm -hmm. right? That it's not just, we're not just all people neutral who just mm -hmm. lack information. You know, that sin comes, I mean, you see this right in Genesis, you know, right in Genesis 3, as soon as they sin, something happens to them. Mm -hmm. You know, their eyes are open, they become mm -hmm. ashamed, the ground's not going to yield to them, the sovereignty's been compromised, the capacity of, of self-giving love and multiplication's been compromised, and now childbearing comes forth and in pain. And, and so, like, something's broken, and if we don't start from that that assumption or that starting place that there's something broken in humanity, then you lose sight of, of a whole lot of other things as well. And, and it doesn't make sense that the, rebellious, the rebelliousness against God. I mean, I think it's fascinating in the Gospels that even after Jesus rises from the dead, right, and the, the Pharisees have sent the guards, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and then the guards come back and they're like, yeah, this, and they like basically tell the Pharisees he rose from the dead, and the Pharisees don't even deny it. They're like, just don't tell anyone. And then they just go right on because it's not a question of information. It's not right. a question of, of, you know, that Jesus just needed to be nicer to him. Like there's a hardness of heart that's retractable. And, um, and that's what sin does to a person. And at some point at the end of the day, it's like, what are you going to do with that? Like, what do we want God to do with that? I mean, like Lewis, he asks the question, like, what, we, what will we ask God to do with that? Mm -hmm. Forgive them? Like he's already made an opportunity for them to be forgiven. Give them what they want. He's like, you know. Well, give them what they want. They want their self-autonomy. They want to be their own gods, you know, and see where that gets you. It gets you into a depraved condition that, like, ruins your humanity.